Well, it gives me a great pleasure today to have uh, First Sergeant Carol Payne um, with us to, to give us an update on uh, potential terrorism in Maine. Um, Carol Payne has got interested in um, terrorism when he served in um, Bosnia and um, was intrigued by what caused people to so suddenly turn violent against each other after so many years of peace. And he's uh, turned that into quite an extensive uh, study and has been studying terrorism all over the world, and in particular, um, it's, it's potential here in Maine. So it gives me great pleasure to turn the program over to Carol Payne. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Carol Payne, President and Founder of World Conflict Quarterly. Um, as I said earlier, I, after serving in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I became interested in terrorism and trying to figure it out and why it happened. Continued that study and most recently served in the Gulf for six months in Iraq and Kuwait and got to apply some of the things I learned firsthand. Of course, looking at all that, I go think about home and how terrorism would apply to us here in Maine. So I wanted to take a look at it. At first glance, Maine appears to be far removed from the dangers of domestic or international terrorism. Uh, but upon further review, I think we can find some things that, that we need to be careful about. We share the second longest border besides Texas with Mexico with Canada. We have thousands of miles of shoreline, and coastline, and uh, navigable rivers all making it very easy to come in and out of the state. We have a ferry service that runs to Canada as well as the numerous islands off the coast. Large cruise ships routinely stop in, in Maine. And of course, a, uh, our large fishing industry. And finally, during the summer months, tens of thousands of people come to Maine from all over. Calais is one of the busiest ports of entry along the entire border with Canada. And Holton is a strategic, strategic location where it's easy to jump across the border to I-95 or to the Canadian highway system. Two international airports, one in Portland, one in Bangor, as well as 163 private airports and commercial airports in the state. Most of those are within an easy flight of a small plane from Canada. We have the railway service, Montreal, Maine and Atlantic Railway. that comes over through Jackman, running through Madawaska, and of course the down easter that runs from Portland to Boston. New England Pipeline, I-95, which runs the entire length of the coast and on state all the way up to Holton. And of course, numerous routes around the state, all making it easy to travel. In Maine, we have the same problem we do everywhere else, as federal authorities have to defend the country. You can't defend against every conceivable threat, so you have to figure out what it, the most likely threat is and then defend against that. Al-Qaeda and Timothy McVeigh were successful because they caught us by surprise. They, they thought outside the box and we didn't. So then the trick is to look at the most likely th threats and then prepare for them. And begin that by studying what the threat is. Narco-terrorism, hate crimes, eco-terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, international terrorism, and cyber terrorism. Starting with narco-terrorism. <clears throat> it has become much harder for terrorists to move funds around the world and fund their activities. More and more they're involved with narcotics deals to raise those funds. Even before September 11th, the Taliban was one of the biggest heroin producers in the world that went primarily to Europe. But for New England, Colombia, I don't need to uh, go on about the, the, the terrorist problems they have in Colombia, but Colombia is a major supplier. The, uh, um, That's the guerrilla movement. It's the guerrilla movement in Colombia. I can't remember exactly what the acronym stands for. But they've been long involved in, uh, in growing the heroin and, and moving it, all for a way of raising money for them. So you got to think about that when uh, the heroin, when heroin is here in Maine. It's become the most primary significant threat here in Maine is bypass cocaine, which was for a long time the primary threat. Um, crack cocaine is in the state. Marijuana is the most widely used and distributed drug. Of course, the diverted pharmaceuticals has become an epidemic in Washington County. The cities are the biggest abusers of heroin. What's, but what is interesting 
is because the price of heroin has declined because it's still available in the, in the major distribution centers, it's actually become cheaper here in Maine. And as it becomes cheaper, it's spread farther out into the rural communities. Colombian and Dominican traffickers are the primary suppliers. The Colombians obviously up to, up to the United States. Dominicans are, are very largely involved in running the distribution centers in Massachusetts. They're also involved in cocaine, crack cocaine, African-American traffickers, Jamaican posses and others, street gangs for crack cocaine, Mexicans, drug trafficking organizations for metafaphine throughout New England, and a whole host of people involved in marijuana. I-95 is the primary transport up into the state. And what's interesting is because the strong narcotic laws have changed for transporting crack cocaine across state lines, they'll send the people down to pick it up and drive it back, and therefore the distributor doesn't have to face a tougher penalty. The lower person in the organization faces it. Motorcycle gangs have historically controlled the marijuana distribution. Just for one, the Hells Angels have a very large presence in Canada. They run a large marijuana distribution ring down through Maine and New Hampshire, and then out through the rest of New England. They then funnel their money back into other clubs worldwide. Maritime smuggling of drugs, obviously with our coastline, the predominant drug being abused by some members of the fishing industry is heroin, as well as cocaine and marijuana are still being smuggled, reminiscent of the uh, prohibition in the 1930s in the smuggling in the country. Okay, let's look at some specific instances that get our attention. In New Old Port in Portland, continue to have a problem with the outside, with uh, motorcycle gangs all fighting over turf battles. What has become uh, interesting is that uh, more and more the Portland police are seeing firearms involved in these battles instead of uh, just assaults on each other. A drug raid in Skowhegan, the police got a lot more than just cocaine. They discovered sticks of dynamite. You can only wonder what he was intending to use that for. Three men pleaded guilty last year to selling crystal meth in Arizona, New Hampshire, and Maine. They were uh, caught with seven pounds, more than 25 guns, and $40,000 in cash. They found a lot of white separatist propaganda with this group. Although there were no formal ties that could be found, the propaganda was there. So now, you had... Uh, now, I, the white separatist movement is not just the KKK. No, uh, Aryan Nations and no, National Alliance. Yep. No, to, just for an example. No, there's numerous organizations yeah. besides them. Um, a non-functioning lab was discovered in Washington County last year. Washington County makes an ideal location for it because it's so remote and the ammonia smell from the natural fertilizer that's also produced by making the drug, it blends in with little, little notice. You get the same result when making homemade bombs, the same ammonia smell that would uh, go unnoticed in such a remote area. Of course, the level of violence goes up the farther you get into the drug culture. These men were planning to assault a pharmacy. They had planned to kill it, whoever they found inside, steal the drugs, keep what they want for personal use, and then sell the rest. They jumped across, why it applies to Maine is they jumped across the border to buy their weapons and then back into New Hampshire. They were infiltrated and stopped prior to the crime. But they don't look, you look at Southern Maine, people jump back and across, across, across that border and don't think twice about it. Not to forget our coastline, the multi-agency maneuver. They boarded numerous vessels in Penobscot Bay and found all kinds of violations in heroin and different problems, as well as the seizure of, of some more pharmaceuticals. Drug, drug traffickers. Now, these incidents that you report, is, is there um, like a central place where you're listed or do you just have to comb the newspaper? Nope, you have to search worldwide. 
to find it. No, keep I keep an eye on the news as it comes out and, and look for the, the little stories. I, I belong to a number of intelligence organizations that we get newsletters that uh, to help point a lot of it out. So, so even in this day and age, there's not a central repository? Right? Not that I'm aware of. The, uh, the large intelligence services are building one, but they're, they're doing it for international terrorists, not so much for uh, domestic. I think it would be, that'd be something uh, we could set up a website at the university, just like to post stuff to our... The incidents as they occur, yep, mm -hmm. to watch for. Um, drug traffickers, I mean, all these things are available over the mar on the uh, market. They're easy to obtain, GPSs, MVGs police scanners. Um, AK-47, those are the automatic? Right, the Krishnikovs. Well, the ones you can buy commercially aren't automatic, but there's only there's a couple pins inside that get changed over and it turns it into an automatic weapon. Same thing with the AR-15s, that's a civilian version of the M-16. And it, it's not automatic, it's semi-automatic, but you change a few pins on the inside. and, and sure the criminals know all that. They, they can figure it out, yep. Okay, so what are we looking at for the, uh, besides the obvious criminal threat here in New England? Um, is it drugs? And as that money's poured back to the Colombians and what happens there? As people become addicted, they'll com commit acts of petty theft and vandalism. Profits are a big problem for the narco terrorists. They gotta find a way to get it out of the country and often the profits are way too big to put in a suitcase and just walk, walk across the border. So you get into uh, money laundering. As we're starting to see the turf battles in Portland, you can see them, some, we'll, we can expect to see them in the other major cities as people fight for who's gonna have the distribution rights for the different drugs. Likely scenarios we've seen nationwide of these time of incidences, incidences pipe bombs, drive-by shootings, murders, assassinations, and so on. And we can't rule out that another crystal meth lab or even a bomb factory in a, in a far remote area of the state. Maine's world renowned for our beauty, our natural beauty, and thousands of tourists come here. All you gotta do is stop at any chamber of commerce and you get maps showing you all the ways across the border on snowmobile trails, ATV trails, hiking trails, without going to an official port of entry. Other threats, police officers stumble across the deal you can get caught in a crossfire with heavily armed criminals. Intentional target, more remote, would be intentional targeting of law enforcement personnel for uh, extortion, kidnapping, or assassination. We see that in Colombia. And the worst case would be the uh, Colombians and, and Dominicans decide to go head to head against the authority to assert, local law enforcement to assert their authority. When you talk about all these attacks on law, Right, it's the potential exists, although we don't, we haven't seen very much of it here. Moving right along to uh, echo terrorism, the Animal Liberation Front and the Earth Liberation Front is the most active group in the United States today. The FBI terms it the most active domestic terrorist group. Now, there was an incident uh, in Maine uh, a couple of years back. There sure was. Some yep. genetically Stocks of corn were all cut down. Yeah. Yes, they were. We're going to talk about it. Okay. Yep. Um, the uh, ALF, ELF mm -hmm. carry out direct actions against whoever they perceive to be abusing the uh, animals, and the intent is to cause financial loss and or free the animals. So have they ever assaulted anybody, or is it all kind of indirect? Yeah. It's mostly indirect. They uh, hang their hat on not, not causing uh, any harm to human beings, Although recently in um, the United Kingdom, one man was almost beaten to death by several activists. So it's, it's starting to change a little bit. Um, since 1976, when, when the groups were started, um, the, according to the FBI, we're looking at 1,100 criminal acts and over $110 million worth of damage. Last year, 75 acts in this country, half of them were animal liberation and half of them were uh, against, against property resulting in over $60 million in damage in, what, in just last year. It's a tough organization because there is no central organization. You ju just decide to join by, by saying that you're going 
get together with some buddies and carry out a, an action. The, uh, any look on the internet, you can find all kinds of uh, central headquarters, but they don't direct any of the outlying branches. After September 11th, we saw a, a slight dip, um, but then the central officers are right out there beating the drum, reminding people that what they're doing wasn't really terrorism, that it was protecting animals, and that despite the horrific terrorist attack, they needed to get out there and maintain the pressure. Now, where the heck is their press office? There's, there's a bunch of them. There's well, uh, primarily in Canada because they've jumped across the line. They were starting to get prosecuted in the United States, but the, there's not a physical office, or they won't give you an address to a physical office you can walk to. It's mostly in a presence over the internet where you can go back and forth. You can trace their machines over the internet. Probably. However, last year they started becoming increasingly more violent. The, uh, an offshoot of the ALF to stop hunting animal cruelty, which was originally formed in the UK and was responsible for the beating attack I mentioned earlier, has gained a lot of press because they've intentionally targeted Huntington Life Sciences and its affiliates for direct actions. Their crime so far, Huntington's, was just to be involved in animal testing for industry. Instead of the direct action of uh, scratching some cars or pouring something in gas tanks, this, they actually use pipe bombs and an ammonium nitrate bomb. Luckily, nobody was injured in these two attacks. But it's the first time we've seen such a high level of violence in the attack. After the first one, they released part of this press release. There will be no quarter given, no half measures taken. You might be able to protect your buildings, but can you protect the homes of every employee? Now, instead of going after just a corporation, they're starting to target individual members. After the second attack, it uh, became even more present. All customers and their families are considered legitimate targets. You never know when your house, your car even might go boom. No more will the killing be done by the oppressors. Now the oppressees will strike back. Yeah, it's a little ty typo. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the first time we've seen such a high level of violence. Some examples of the ELF. They like to target resort towns with large expensive houses. Car dealerships intentionally targeting SUVs because of uh, they use too much gas. They also have intentionally targeted a number of universities across the country engaged in research, causing extensive amounts of damage. The incident we were talking about earlier, the Acadian Green Brigade against Boise Cascade, where they uh, glued a number of doors, punctured tires, ruined some uh, trucks and trailers. That's not the first time that they've been active here in the state of Maine, though. Mm. That was in Portland. Yes, it was. Fairfield, 2002, a company working for Jackson Labs. They went into the construction site and managed to wreck a lot of equipment. Mm. Again, we're targeting universities. Wait, wait, could you just go back? Sure can. Universities are continuously targeted for research, and it's easy to cause a lot of a lot of damage. What, what, what was their beef with the urban horticulture? They were doing some sort of uh, genetic research on changing crops. That, that makes them very upset. The the crop the the crops. Um, University of Minnesota, two million dollars in damage. Again in Maine. This time they uh, targeted, in 1999, they targeted a number of uh, sportsmen's clubs. Three different ones were damaged in the state, and they vowed to continue more. These are most likely different groups of people. It's not one continuous group. Something that we had not seen before from the ALF, but a uh, radical offshoot, the Justice Department engaged in their own version of WMD, mailing envelopes, over 80 envelopes to various parts of the country with razor blades 
right on the inside. So as you open the envelope, you slice your thumb and the razor blade, the note inside told you the razor blade had been dumped in rat poison. Was it? A number of them tested positive mm -hmm. for it. So we think a WMD in a, a huge anthrax or smallpox attack, it can be quite simple as well. Yeah, when we, that was the incident. Right. Here, right here at the University of Maine. And of course, the LF signature attack was in 1998 at Vail, Colorado, when they burnt down an entire a, uh, ski resort that had been all the new construction was almost done. They set some fires, burnt it all to the ground, $12 million in damage. Wow, was the ski resort doing research? No, nope, they were expanding the, the, uh, research, the uh, resort into a new lodge and some new trails. So has anybody ever been caught from any of these? Oh yeah, a number of people have gone to jail for it, but typically the, uh, the penalties are very small because it's so hard to prove who did it in, in intent. Okay, what can we expect from eco-terrorism? Well, today in this age, it's very easy to uh, look at cyber terrorism, although it's not really cyber terrorism, but, but if you get in and you can hack somebody's website or get into their database and, and mess with it, denial of service attacks, you only need one laptop in a, in a room and access to a server, and somebody who's pretty bright can figure out how to do that pretty easily. Um, the other more likely threat as well is uh, at logging or construction sites across the state where the, the equipment will be what they call monkey wrenching, which is you know gluing the door shut, pouring sand in the gas tank, spray painting it. And they're pro they may or may not go rep unreported because they'll think it's just vandalism and it's only one piece of machinery, so it may not even ever make the press or the police. Utilize hoaxes to bring attention to their cause. It's easy to, uh, we see this from uh, different groups you mail a, a letter with a baby powder in it, tell them it's anthrax. You shut down the building at least for the day, cause some economic. Could occur, it has occurred. Right. Well, I'm talking about from uh, the echo terrorists. No, but it's on the bottom when you say it could occur. At the University of Maine, yep. And it has, right, in 1999. And bombings, which is new and we haven't seen from them before. Jackson Labs, which is targeted already. The ski areas could become a target and everybody thinks of paper mills but I found no instances where paper mills were intentionally targeted as far as the mill itself. Now maybe some logging equipment off-site that sort of thing. Okay, domestic extremists and uh, William Pierce who was the founder of the National Alliances is, is usually credited with, with this coming up with this structure but they called it leaderless, uh, the leaderless resistance where you have a national leader, but he has no contacts with the pe no contact with the people following who are actually committing the acts. So he'll be out there talking about hatred or, or whatever, but you dream up to go take a shot at somebody on your own or, or to or to attack a synagogue on your own. There's no there's no connection between the two. Prior to September 11th, the worst terrorist attack in this country was Oklahoma City by Timothy McVeigh. That was domestic terrorism. Well, he was convicted in the federal court. Now he's, they brought him against state charges. Yeah, but nine years later? Yep. I, I don't... I have no idea. Yeah. Both confirmed and unconfirmed reports of all kinds of white separatists or uh, extremists in the state. Remember, it only takes a small cell of one, two, three people. Well, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols are just two people. That's right. Primary concern are the Somalians and not necessarily from attack, although that, that, I guess that would be possible, but they were uh, targeted by the World Church of the Creator in Lewiston, got na nationwide and worldwide attention. The counter demonstration was very successful, but the tactic of calling for a rally isn't to raise members right there. The members will come later in quiet, but to make their presence known throughout the area. Nathan Hale was scheduled to speak. He did not because he was arrested for applying the murder of a federal judge. He's just recently been convicted of that crime. Like I said, it doesn't, the, the uh, public rally doesn't reflect the actual number of extremists that may be living in the area. 
And of course, Somalian or other immigrants would be targeted by these kinds of people. Closer to home, right here in Old Town, just recently, creator of a web website called whitehomeland.com. And uh, I looked at the website, it was very disturbing. Does he have his name on it? Yeah, but I didn't want to put it on the slide. <laughs> okay. I wasn't too sure about, about uh, lab, lab laws and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, he has a name on the website all over it. In Florida, I bring this up because we'll come back to that one again later. But uh, the right extremists and the right to life movement are very active in bombing and, and targeting doctors. And this is just bizarre. <laughs> I, but you got to be concerned when, when, when any group of people get together and build a uh, tribute to mass murderers on it. <laughs> yeah. Just last year, a bomb threat the federal building where the package was remo removed and destroyed. They're bombing it? They, they haven't said, they, they haven't released the investigation. All, all, it's, all they'll say is it's under investigation. So, taking that they took it out into a parking lot somewhere and blew it up, and they're being tight lipped, you gotta assume that there probably was some sort of explosive device. 2002, I think this was related to the National Alliance and the World Church of the Creator, but again, making the presence known in the community, getting out there leaving leaflets all over the place. This one in 2002 just shows the, uh, some of the extremes these people will go to. William Carr, mistake. he got caught because he made a mistake. He sent false IDs that were intended for the New Jersey militia to a house in Staten Island, who then turned it in, and law enforcement authorities chased it back. When they finally searched his home, they found, I forget the exact amount, but of sodium cyanide, more than enough to kill 30,000 people. The New Jersey militia. Uh, a, mil a militia group, yep. State no, 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 no. As part of the militia movement, where they create their own. Oh, I guess it's good addressing. Yeah. <laughs> but he had uh, machine guns, silencers, remote control bombs. Most of these kind of people are just fanatics. Uh, but yeah, what? They are, they are a little... And he has, like I see, his long involvement with militia groups. Here in Maine. We had a number of, of uh, mailboxes that were blowing up for a little while, and we didn't know why. As was expected, some, some teenage boys were just being stupid. But you, you got to look for these trends and then see if they're leading to something. Quite often, these kinds of terrorists, they're looking to set that spark that will supposedly rise everybody else up in the cause. That's what Timothy McVeigh was planning when he... When well, is that oh, shortwave station still broadcast? As far as I know, I don't have a shortwave radio, so I couldn't tune into that to find it or not. But uh, I went to the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, which specializes in that, and that's where I got the information that and they said it was still active. Okay. And of course, during the 90s, it, there's a number of racially motivated incidences. Do you have any insight into these guys down who were just arrested for that shooting in Falmouth? Are they just, is that random, or are they? I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if they did belong to one of these groups, but there hasn't. The police haven't released enough to, to make that connection yet. Mm -hmm. But you got to you got to think in in Maine that that sort of, that that that's probably what they're they're linked to. We don't see a lot of racial crime unless the person is extremely motivated mm -hmm. to do something so like that. This guy Joseph Franklin who killed two black youths. Yep. Uh, did these murders take place in Maine? Yes, they did. Yep back in 1980. That came right off the uh, Attorney General's website here in Maine. Now, was that guy, Eric Rudolph, convicted? Yes, well, he, the, he's undergoing trial right now. He hasn't been convicted yet. But he's the, uh, he hid in the mountains for five years and was only caught because a law enforcement officer saw him um, rummaging in a dumpster. And when he stopped him, he recognized him and, and, and arrested him. But he is a uh, Responsible for the Olympic game, well, the bombing at Atlantic in the Olympic you know Games. That? I mean, if he hasn't been convicted, you, you can't say he's responsible. Well, okay. I, I it's mean, a yeah. He hasn't been convicted yet, so I guess I can, in, a, in a court of law. Although, uh, yeah, yeah, you might want to say allegedly. Allegedly, most people believe. <laughs> uh, 
that, that he is responsible. What's the, uh, well, you know, what a lot of people don't know about, about the Atlantic Olympic Games was there was a second bomb, time to go off 20 minutes later, that authorities found and defused. If it had, it was aimed at taking out rescue workers. Eric Rudolph also did that. He did the same thing at a uh, family, well, he's allegedly did the same thing at a family planning, family in Atlanta where it did injure, injure rescue workers. And he's believed responsible for mailing thousands of envelopes that, uh, suppose, that, that were, uh, supposedly had anthrax in them to family planning clinics across the country. And of course, we've had our own racial incidents here in Maine. We watch for these things to make sure it's not starting the beginning of a trend. Of course, we come back to the easiest. It only takes with with a laptop, or, you know, with a computer. It is very easy to go out and start attacking uh, and causing some problems. Small cells of ex domestic extremists. We have to wonder about the incidents under Maine, Southern Maine, and, and see, wonder if that wasn't in some way involved. Continue to expect attacks against individual minority members or. Uh, People with alternative lifestyles, spray painting of graffiti or racial systems, swastikas on uh, synagogues, that sort of thing. And the right to life movement is very active. Most of them are law onboarding, but there are a few extremists, like the man we saw in Florida who had, uh, gr had been in the military. And we cannot rule out environmental terrorism from these kind of people. It has happened before, and First World War German agents were able to uh, to a limited extent, spread ganders among the horses and mules in Philadelphia. What is a gander? It's a uh, um, type of disease. It's, it, it affects the uh, horses and mules. It makes them so they uh, make them weak, tires, like an extreme fatigue. Uh -huh. and, uh, is it fatal? Or? No, it's not fatal, it's but, but it's more of a nuisance. But if, your whole, but if uh, during the First World War, the automobiles were just starting to be introduced, sure. I mean, it was all driven by horses and mules, if you can affect that stock, you can slow down a whole assault based on that alone. We always think about the chlorine gas and mustard gas used in the trenches, but there's lots of other ways. Um, mad cow disease in England, nobody believes that was a terrorist incident, but it, it gives you a pretty good model for if somebody was able to spread. I mean, nobody some, believes that it was. No, no, but it gives you a good model for uh, if somebody had spread an agent among livestock, what, what could be a they lost billions and billions of dollars. Okay, WMD, weapons of mass destruction, can't miss that one. Uh, threatening letters with ricin in South Carolina. Supposedly this person was mad about the new trucking industry laws. <laughs> Did he think they were getting too much rest or not enough? They were, take, they were forcing him to take too much time off and then they couldn't drive and so it was costing them economically. Can we just back up? Yep. It, it, did in, it did, in fact, both letters did, in fact, have ricin in them when but, they tested positive. But how is ricin? I'm, I'm a little it's a poison extracted from castor beans. Right, but don't you have to ingest it? Yeah, well, it, either skin or ingest it, and, and it's fatal. There's no known antidote. Right. The ones that they were inside the vials, the ones in these uh, envelopes. Right. They were, there are some records of uh, the CIA and KGB doing some odd things during the Cold War where... Uh, I, I remember the incident of, so of one man in London was killed. Is, um, I mean, would you die if you just touched it? No, you got to get on a little more than that. I mean, but the the uh, attack by the KGB in London, they used a umbrella right. and they just injected a small pellet underneath the skin, right. and and that was fatal to him. So it doesn't take very much. No, I know, but I'm just wondering. I, mean, the I don't know what the fatal through a letter doesn't yeah. seem to be. Like no, it's it's. It got the press he wanted. It shut down the facility for however long they took to go and, and, and check and make sure that it wasn't contamination all over the place. So he got the results he wanted. And you got to think, he probably really didn't want to kill a lot of people because he put it inside of a vial. If he wanted to kill people, you just smeared it all over the envelope, right? So they never caught this guy? Nope, still under investigation. <clears throat> of course, there was our own WMD incident here in Maine with arsenic up in New Sweden. Although, I mean, it's funny calling that a WMD incident because, I mean, arsenic is an ancient poison and it's been used for... Thousands of years, yep. Yeah, I mean, 
Well, we got to look at in in something like this is that, uh, and we'll show it in, in a minute. Like the Japanese terrorist group UM carried out a number of experiments in rural areas before they actually lost the subway attacks. This this was like you know an isolated incident for whatever reason. They had a real problem with the church. Did you read any of the other? Uh, there were two books that just came out on this. On this, I haven't read any of the books on this. I've just read all the clippings. And this happened while I was overseas, so I had to go. Well, the two books that just came out, one by, I think, somebody from the area, and another one by somebody from, you know, I hate to use the phrase, or the phrase from away, who came and got fascinated. By yeah. it. I haven't read either one. Daniel Bonson ended up committing suicide, and they found arsenic in his shed, and, and I think most people believe he did it. However, police reported that, that there was another individual may be involved, but there's been no arrests, and they, they continue to say it's uh, under investigation. The int one of the other interesting things was the federal guidelines with pharmaceuticals wouldn't allow the states to stockpile them. Maine decided to do it on their own. When this incident occurred, they had the antidote in Portland were able to get it up there and probably saved a lot of those people's lives just by doing it. And as a result of that, they changed the federal law so that the states could stock it in their areas. Okay, and of course we know about the anthrax attacks in the wake of September 11th. We still don't know who did it. People continue to argue whether it was domestic extremists taking well, advantage. I've, I've been told by people that they know who did it. They just can't prove it. Okay. Well, the, uh, they, the uh, charges against or allegations against the scientists come up repeatedly. I don't know. What does concern, though, all those people that were attacked, we had the ones in the mail room and so on, but these two ladies were separate and they, nobody can figure out how they came in contact with the anthrax. They got put there somehow. How'd they get it? Nobody knows. Well, I, I mean, anthrax does occur in nature. Right. Were they able to rule out any kind of anthrax? They did in Connecticut and she was still in the city in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. so, so you just gotta wonder, like I said about the Japanese group, um, where they did their remote testing as a precursor. They actually traveled to Australia and used sarin gas against sheep to test the, the effectiveness of it before they brought it back in the, and used it in the subway. They, well, I'll wait till we get to that slide. There's more about them. Of course, we had our own problem with hoaxes here in Maine. Hundreds of people called up and said that they've been exposed. That, you know, and that brings the other problem in the wake of a WMD attack. Everybody wanted Cipro because they thought they had been exposed, whether there was a realistic chance that they actually were or not, what, what will happen to pharmaceutical supplies if there's a much larger attack. Like I said, Japanese group on um, for 10, 10 separate attacks. They were never able to get an effective aerosol um, in, the, in the actual attack. They punctured small bags. Right. So only the people who were in the immediate area were exposed. Um, well, unfortunately, there were some subway staff who cleaned up the mess, you know, and, and it's just hor horrible. I mean, they, they didn't have to do it. They, but they did it anyways, uh, right? Totally unprepared. Exactly. If they had been aerosized, it, it would have been just horrific. But it was a wake-up call for the country. These militia groups, there's a lot more. I just picked this one because of the ricin and it was a known militia group. Um, but they were arrested and convicted for uh, trying to poison several government officials with ricin. They had done it on their own. 1984, everybody forgets about Oregon, but a religious call. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the point I'm trying to make is WMD is not new. It wasn't uh, just the anthrax letters. The weathermen allegedly uh, threatened to contaminate water supplies. Another company, another uh, organization, the Order of the Rising Sun in Chicago. Yeah, but like you say, I mean, if you just pour a conventional biological agent into water supply, You're not, it gets chlorinated, which the whole point is to kill all biological agents. So. Exactly. Of course, during World War II, Unit 731, oh. famous for the, uh, their horrific actions in China, they took it one step farther than the uh, Nazis by intentionally exposing. Oh, I've read a number of books on them. Yes. Yeah, oh. Yep. 
they uh, intentionally spread just thousands and tens of thousands of fleas. In fact, it would plague over uh, large cities. I mean, Chinese population took a, a horrific beating. And of course, I already talked about the horses in World War I, and uh, there are hard to find documented cases of uh, the small, the blankets inf infected with smallpox, but it's talked about in native folklore quite often that, uh, that it was, oh, was you used. Don't have any right, that's the hard part. There's only one or two known documented, but it was assumed to be widespread. Okay, potential indications that we have to watch out for. Um, just like what happened in New Sweden, aerosol into a ventilation system in a building would be horrific. Uh, we have large fairs throughout the state every fall. Some of us they spread an agent through there to the uh, livestock or in remote areas of the state just, uh, just to test their agent. Some other uh, popular theories is that uh, an international terrorist organization would intentionally infect one of their members with a disease and send them on a tour through the country as, an, as a tourist. As a person's infectious, they spread the disease until they finally die somewhere, but they've managed to spread the... Uh, well, it'd have to be a pretty infectious disease. Yeah, like smallpox is, is what they normally talk about. But, um, but that, the, the problem, I guess, with smallpox is they need to have a reservoir of it. Where would they have gotten it? Right. And you can't just create smallpox no. out of nothing. So I'm not, you know, I can't when, they, when they talk about this, the smallpox theory, mostly they talk about uh, stealing it or uh, buying it from uh, the Soviet Union or our former republics in the Soviet Union that, that lost accountability for a lot of it. I don't know how accurate it is, but when you read the literature, that one pops up yeah, quite I often. Know. I mean, like anthrax, you can't spread anthrax. Nope. It's hard to find one that you can actually spread just by walking around among the population. Plague's a good one, um, and that one's uh, that's yeah, but, easy to spread. But plague, though, doesn't it get spread by bites of mosquitoes and things like that? It can. It, it depends on, 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 I mean, if they are able to take a, a, a plague survey and aero size it and, like, spread it, then, oh, that, yeah. then that would affect yeah, a lot of people. Naturally, no, naturally occurring, it's like from fleas from rodents yeah, well, who have it. Yeah, what I'm saying is, I mean, the scenario you were talking about, about a, a person being infected walking around yeah. spreading it, I don't think they could spread plague that way. If, um, sure they could. Pneumatic plague. How do you get it from coughing? Right. Um, yeah, there's lots of different ideas about how you could do it, and WMD is only limited by your imagination on how far it can go. Finally, the right to life. You know, even if, even if it's a hoax and they still achieve their what they wanted, then, then it's still a terrorist act. Much has been made of dirty bombs, and uh, everybody cites the difficulty of getting some sort of waste into the country. But what if they targeted like a major hospital for the radiological department? The actual release would be tiny, but the public panic would be huge following such an incident. I picked a hospital. There's lots of other places that use a radioactive yeah, isotopes in, in commercial. Tend to have tons and tons of nope. stuff. I mean, it'd be a couple ounces. Right, and and they, like I said, the actual consequence of the radiation would be small, but the uh, public panic afterwards, I think, would be would be large. Okay, international terrorism in the state. We all know that on the uh, the Muhammad Atta traveled to Maine, that's where he jumped on the plane in Portland and into Boston. So, so they, when you say departed, they came from Boston? They came so from Boston, drove up to Maine, spent the night, jumped on the plane the next morning. And flew to? And flew to Boston. Why, did, why didn't they just get on the plane in Boston? Nobody knows. Nobody knows why they came up here. Huh. Because you, well, they you started gotta, in Boston. Not that, we, not that anybody knows of. <laughs> hmm. 
American and Canadian intelligence organizations have verified the presence of all these different groups inside the United States. I mean, we, we have to know after September 11th, the country has been successfully infiltrated. Hamas, Hezbollah, Koch is an extremist Jewish organization, so it's not just the Islamists. The IRA. Has Koch ever done anything? Yeah, they've, they've uh, attempted to murder a couple of people. They're much more active in Israel than they are in the United States. What these groups tend to do um, is they here in the United States to raise funds, buy materials, and then send them back. We, they've been doing it for years. Previously, down in North and South Carolina, Hezbollah was active in smuggling cigarettes yeah. in, in, as a way of raising uh, raising funds. Brewer, 2003, two men were stopped because they were in a New York City cab and they were off the highway. That's just unbelievable. Yep. Um, of course, they weren't terrorists, but it just demonstrates the concept of the uh, pipeline up 95. They're attempting to flee so they wouldn't have to register. It's, it's not one So it they probably would have been. Crossed, first of all, what would have happened if they'd gotten to the border? I'm assuming they just would have gone into Canada and claimed asylum. Canada has very liberal asylum laws. They would, have just they would have claimed asylum from Pakistan, not from the United States. <clears throat> they just didn't want to, after the Patriot Act, and uh, they said people from a, men between a certain age from certain countries had to register. They didn't want to register, and that's why they fled. Uh -huh. I don't know if there was something in their background or not. So There's, what happened to them? They got deported? As far as I know. We already talked a little bit about uh, money laundering. But in 2002, SARS are, you know, amounts yeah, greater than 5,000. Yeah, that's a acronym because now it's confused with the disease. And, yes. And, and I, yeah, I, I look at that SARS, they said there were 3,000 SARS <laughs> cases in Connecticut. Whoa, I missed that. And, uh, but we're looking at 372. And a prob you know, you got to guess probably quite a few more related to drugs, but, I mean, I don't know that. Sure. The Asian Club and Colombian Dominican drug trafficking organizations use the front companies to launder the money. Um, the DEA readily admits that it's prevalent throughout New England as a way to launder funds. They've uh, actually, the most creative one I, I found was they filled PVC pipes with cash and then were trying to get them across the border. Okay, right in 2001, Key Bank here in Boston, I mean Key Bank here in Maine, and of course Key Bank did nothing illegal, just want to make that clear. But a company that had an account through them wired the money to the United Arab Immigrants, and the State Department later put that organization on their list of financial institutions that supported terrorism. So you can see, although I want to stand, I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't make a case in court, but you can see it, a line of where it goes. Again, international terrorism, what's going to happen, what could happen in the state. You got to look at uh, computer viruses and so on. A corridor is often discussed between here and Canada. You got to wonder about President Bush's home in Kennebunkport. That'd be a high priority target, whether he was there or not, just for its media effect. Money laundering. Cannot rule out against a military facility just because. And the same thing with ferry bombings, police stations, aircraft hijacking. These are all very small probability, very low, but you can't say it, it won't happen. Cyber terrorism. Cyber terrorism hasn't occurred so far that we know of, although everybody worries well, about it. You know, I, I guess it depends on what you mean. I mean, Maine has certainly been hit by all the worms and viruses. Yep. That well, the FBI defines it as a internet or a computer attack combined with a physical attack at the same time. Oh, so that, that's, what, that's what they're looking at for cyber terrorism, but I agree. I, I mean, I, if you... I don't like if you, that definition. No, if you start... Because, you know, I, I mean, if, if you disable a million computers and then punch somebody, that's cyber terrorism. Yep. If you just disable a million computers, that's not cyber yep. terrorism. Well, I mean, if you disable half the computers on Wall Street, certainly that's a terrorist attack. Yeah, right. I mean, no, but, but the point is, but if you then just punch... A secretary, yep. then it's cyber terrorism. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it just seems kind of a funny definition. 
And that came from his testimony, the director's testimony to Congress. But uh, just to demonstrate some other cases that have, that have happened, India and Pakistan and the, over the Kashmir conflict, they regularly go back and attack each other's websites, cause damage, um, download files that they're not, not, not supposed to have. Pakistan claim, uh, India claims there wasn't anything sensitive. Pakistan says there was. During the uh, airstrikes by NATO, Yugoslavia almost shut down the uh, NATO servers by their ping attacks and uh, infected emails and so on. Something I never thought about, but with all the problems in Israel but going back and forth, it's only natural to escalate to attacks through the internet on each other. The Taliban, of course, was defaced in the wake of September 11th, their websites. Changing a news story. This happened after uh, September 11th. It was a little, had nothing to do with it, but a hacker manipulated a story on Yahoo News saying that this pro programmer was facing a death penalty. In reality, he wasn't facing any charges at all. But that's what went out worldwide. The Army and the Pentagon are always famous um, for being targeted. This one was very interesting, May of last year. <clears throat> These people were able to break into their computers and uh, were trying to uh, hold it for ransom and they sent data so they knew they had been in there. Right. Well, what was concerning them was that they were able to, they, they could have gotten into the computer that actually controlled the life support systems or had a big effect on the life support systems in the, down, in the, down in the Arctic. I, I don't know that those are really on computers run the life support. They were, yeah, eliminated by the amount of a slide, but they were very concerned about that. The FBI jumped right on it. But I'll give them points for being creative. Yeah, very strange. Yep. I talked about cybercrime just a little bit. There's tons written about it, and they all have different numbers other than we all realize it's astronomical. Okay, what well, we can expect in the uh, global war on terrorism, of course, attacks on government websites, the Pentagon, and so on. Denial of service attacks, especially at a critical time. Worms, viruses, like we talked about. And nobody's done it yet, but if uh, we always talk about if they're able to get into that power grid and start shutting it down, the effect that would have. Maine would certainly be affected if they're able to shut down huge computer networks through a denial of service. Remember, right when President Bush took office and the China incident with the planes, the, uh, we all had to button up everything and you couldn't send attachments and everything else because of the the computer viruses that were coming back and forth. Now you're going to give us this impressive methodology here. Right. I'm not going to go into it, but I want to demonstrate I used the methodology when I looked at what I was doing. 2002, May 2002 is when I first did this. And those were my guess, my, uh, what I thought would happen then. You know, can't prove a corridor. I think it's probably happening. Computer hacking, I think that's probably happening. The Somalian refugees were able to uh, see that one coming. Hate crimes, I think that one's a given. And the ELF, that, that had to be expected. Second, most likely, I think money laundering is a given. Luckily, no law enforcement was caught. And then we get into the more, more low priority events that could happen. 2004, this is what I just, when I just reworked it all. Obviously, a computer attack. Everybody in the, is concerned about the fourth quarter of this, of this year and the presidential elections, especially after Spain. Terrorists or drug dealers use this corridor between Canada and engage in vandalism, money laundering, all things that could happen. Infiltration, the yeah, uh, no, snowmobile no, ATVs. The for, I mean, they, that's where they came in. They came in fourth overall. Right, what you have to do is you take all, I did an enable spreadsheet, take the organizations across the top, narco terror, CLF, WMD, domestic extremists, then down the other side, you list all the possible events. Then you just matrix across, giving it a probability score. 
then that you add it all up at the end. But it's a probability score, something you subjectively assign. It's subjectively assigned. How else can you do it? Uh, then you, well, I don't know. yeah, I mean, I'm asking. yeah, no, subjectively assigned. I use a point system of one, two, or three, with three being very likely and, and one being almost not likely. And it's based on research. You, you dig in and find out as much as you can, and then say where the. Many people have been killed by ricin besides this poor diplomat? Very few. I, that's the one that comes to mind. I think you'd be hard pressed to find more than that. Yeah. Let's see, uh, law enforcement or drug dealers, they can start getting carried away. <clears throat> bombings, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see that. I'm talking about like pipe bombings, that sort of thing. ELF will visit us again, I'm quite sure about that. They seem to average about one something once a year. Interesting enough, they publish their own report yearly, listing all the actions nationwide that people have claimed. Then you check it against the press to see if it's was it actually happened or not. Still worried about the Somalians in Lewiston. I think they're likely targets by extremists. And then the last probability, just don't see it happening. There are limits. I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying a potential is there. Yeah, that concludes my presentation. Well, thank you. That's quite a whirlwind tour. Can I get a copy? Sure. It's big. Um, I have to check the size for it. It's fairly big. About a hundred slides. So. No, no, but I mean. Just... Yeah, I haven't checked what size it is. Right. Well, maybe you can come to my office. Yep. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> you saw it, Carol. All right. Yep. yep. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>